Thank you so much. All right. Good to see all of you here this morning. Thank you for standing to honor the Lord's word. It's really great, wonderful. Thank you, sweetheart, for the communion. And it is good to see all of you here. Hey, welcome. If you're here for the first time, the second time, welcome. For the rest of you, welcome home. All right, okay. Wonderful. And um, it's so good to be back again and um, so good to see what God is going to do today. Are you ready for the word? Okay. All right, and uh, so before we get to the Word, let's get going with communion. Can we do that? All right, okay, so communion um, is something so important to the, to the aspects of our life as a Christian, and uh, communion, is this, as we take of it, um, it is not a representation of, uh, rather a representation of religion. It's not a representation of who we are, but who we are to God. And it shows that how deep His love, how great the sacrifice, and what He has done for us on the cross. It shows us that we are able because of what the cross did for us. We're able to do what we're able to do, all things in Christ who strengthens us. We're able to defeat the things that we struggle with. We can overcome the things that we are tempted with, and God is with us. And I thank you, God, that this body that is broken Lord, remember what you have done on the cross, Lord. As we take of it in remembrance, in honor and gratitude, we thank you that our bodies are healed. Lord, we declare that our minds are made whole. Our emotions are well. Lord, as we partake of this, healing comes, Lord. God, we believe in miracles. And we partake of this, we believe in miracles will happen in our mind, soul, and body. In Jesus' name, amen. And this cup represents the body that was not only broken, but shed the blood. That every drop of that blood was part of God's blood. Shed from us every single part and drop of that blood was pure and perfect. Nothing stained at all. The highest quality of blood can ever exist in all of the universe. And that was shed for us. And only the most precious and the most perfect blood can wash away our sins to make us perfectly right with God. And we're not half right with God, we're completely right with God. We're not just half saved, we are fully saved. And so this is what happens to us. And the, and the salvation that we have is permanent. And we don't have to question it every day, am I saved or not tomorrow? You know, that's, that's not how God works and that is not the nature of the Lord and His blood shed washes us completely clean of our sins and we thank Him for that. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Serena. It's so good to have you guys back again. I, I didn't know what songs they're going to play and um, I don't every week because I like to have it moved by the Holy Spirit. So every song they play is basically my sermon today. And we're going to try to capture the essence of what the Lord did on worship right into the Word of God and, and bring you to a home run, okay? And that's what we want to do. We want to get you into a home run. But before I do, I want to just share a little bit about my trip last week. Um, as you know, I know it's the first time in my life I have missed a Resurrection Sunday. I heard it was fantastic. It was wonderful to see what God did. From the video, I watched all the uh, both services after I finished preaching. The reason I had to go for the first time in my life was because um, Cambodia, the new life in Cambodia, had celebrated their 30th anniversary. And uh, 30 years, it is awesome. And when we first went there, when we first went there in 1994, um, I went with my pastor and we sat down and I remembered I was with Pastor Paul and we went there, went to my pastor's home and the only uh, new souls that was there were basically just, I think, four to five people. Four to five people in this, in this little gathering that we had. I kind of figured, you know, we're going to plant in Cambodia. If we get 100 people, I'm so happy we've done our job. You know, planted a little um, uh, um, a church there for the Lord. And, and we went at a time where it had just ended the civil war. So everywhere you went in Cambodia, they all had blue helmets and machine guns. Every night you could hear gunfire. Every night you could hear gunfire. And that was when we planted the church. Nothing was there. The, ch the 
nation just opened up. The pastors that were pastors today, um, one of them had a motorbike, um, came from the, from, the, from the countryside, had $1,000, and rode into looking, uh, looking for a job to be a translator. And so, so they came and they to the English classes. We, we started English classes and we led them. We went to the universities. We preached and shared the gospel with them. And uh, lo and behold, so this year was the 30th anniversary. Um, it was fantastic. They held, they held it at uh, the biggest convention hall they could find, uh, which was in the biggest mall and newest mall called Aeon 3, uh, right at Honsen Boulevard. And it was there and... Uh, just tremendous to see pastors from Brazil, the United States, from all over the world that came to celebrate. And, um, and so on Sunday, I was just, you know, I thought I'd just go there to celebrate, but, but the senior pastor said, Pastor, I want you to preach. I'm getting all the churches together, and we are going to have only one service on Sunday, and I'd like you to preach that Sunday. I said, it's your church. You should be preaching, and I'm going to have to celebrate with you. And said, no, you know, I want you to preach. So I ministered the, the Word of God on that Sunday. So just to give you a picture, do we have the pictures just to show you real quickly? From 1994 until now, what has happened to New Life here? This is what we have, okay? This is, uh, this is, the, this is, this is the church. From zero, zero, we had zero. We had no converts. We went there to win souls. This is it. Those are, and, and by the way, these are not the church members. These are all leaders. Pastors, Pastors and leaders. The, the volunteers, we had 300 volunteers already. We, this is, New Life is the big, biggest church in Cambodia. It's the biggest church. There's no other church as big as this, okay? And so then they, uh, it's really happening. You're going to come with me next time, okay? It's really happening. And they are, uh, worship and they worship. You go there, you feel like you're at home. Same worship, same DNA, same everything. Prophecies, everything, signs, wonders, miracles, everything we do, they do as well, okay? So, so if this can happen, and, and I and my wife and the leaders are instrumental, we are mentors, we are their pastors, we are their mentors, we are their, we are their big bros, they listen to us for all major decisions that they make, this can happen to you as well. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Amen. Do you believe that? You see, it is not about the size, it is about... God doesn't care about the size. God, God cares about winning souls. Yeah. Every single one of them is, was a new believer. No church transfers. All new souls. All new souls. Okay? And so I, we, I also I have another, a video as well. I'll show you the video. So if you look... That's the senior pastor, Pastor Samadhi. Come on, come on. Come on, give God a praise. Uh, Brother Richard, uh, our John Mark of the church, uh, he's, he was there taking the video for us and fantastic. So, so um, uh, no, you can ask Richard, he said he was blown away what God did, in, uh, uh, what God has done in Cambodia. Blown away what God has done. We've got schools, we've got um, uh, all kinds of NGO activities. Uh, we've got schools that are fully packed with students and doing so well. So after that, after that, so here's the story about God answering. Okay, so today the message is about God answers. Shenda Hui Ying, okay? So God answers, okay? So I'm going to teach you, I'm going to explain to you about God answers, but I'm going to show you, the, I'm going to tell you this story first. So, so the church here, church here, so when we started the church, the average income was 50 bucks per person. So 10 years forward, after that, $200. Today it's about $500 US, okay? So the church had got. So I taught the church a few years ago how to use the money they have and buy land. Because God, the Lord told me that land will increase and the land has gone up 10 times. So the church has made some money, okay, by seeding, buying, selling of land. I taught them how to do that. I taught the pastors how to, how to also do that as well. And, and they've, they've done well, okay. So they're okay. But then, but then they didn't still have enough money because property price in Cambodia went much faster than what they collected, okay? So they had like $50,000 US in the church, okay? That is like probably the most in any church there, okay? So 50,000 US. So they wanted, and so one of the guys in the church was working for the, a, a, a tycoon, a rich man, okay? And this rich man had got a plot of land 
at um, uh, uh, um, uh, what it calls uh, Honsen Boulevard. Honsen Boulevard is a, is a new road that's connecting to the new airport. And it's going right to the city. So this guy has plots of land on the side. And he has, so he's a huge developer with a lot of land. And he basically built a, he said, I'm going to build a town, a literal town. So he had, he had uh, an international school there, Mercedes dealership there, Aeon 3, the biggest mall there. And he had also hospital there. So it's all there developed right now. Okay, so it's going to be a growing next area of growth. But he says to himself, okay, so our church member there is the PA to, to the big boss and his brothers. So the three brothers, they own all that land there. And they said, then he said, the one thing I, I lacked in that area is a church. Amen. Then he turns to the PA, okay? And then he says, he says so Pete, you know, so Pete, I want to ask you this question. Do you, um, you go to a church, I know your church new life, your church does a lot of good works for the country, okay? I want to give this piece of 300,000 square feet of land to your church, but I want to sell it to your church for $1.5 million. It's very cheap because it's now worth about $4 million, but I'm selling for one point five. very cheap to your church. Can you ask the church to, to buy it, you know, and then we'll let you build your, your building there. 300,000 square feet, okay, that's big. So the church went and church started and said 300,000, we've got 50,000, so he said, well, he wants 1.5, here's 50,000, you know, this is what we can afford. Then he says, ah, yeah, I cannot. Then they discussed this class, they said, can I forget it? Uh, you know, you can't afford it. And then he went back. And then when, this is a true story. Then he slept at night. And he got up in, in the night. He got up in the night and he had a vision. He had a vision. Okay, this man is a Buddhist. He's not a Christian. I'm telling you the story, he's a Buddhist. Okay? He says now, the church is doing good works. And then he says, then he says, I saw a picture of a sugar cane. And when you put the sugar cane into the presser, the juice comes out. But when the sugar cane comes out, there's no more juice. So the church is like this dried sugar cane. No matter how I squeeze, there's no more water. <laughs> you know what? I think that's the wrong thing. Then he calls his PA the next day. He says, you know what? You tell your church right now. I will give them the land for free. A miracle of God, I'm telling you. Are we, I, after, that, after that big thing you saw, we all went in the searing heat of 40 degrees, sweating like buckets, going there, and then standing in the middle of the land, and then they are telling us stories about the miracles. I'm hearing that's why I'm recalling the stories. And then after I, we prayed for the land and believing. And uh, that now that we have the land for free, we need to find someone to build it. And you know what? God found somebody to build it. Because the person that I prophesied on seven years ago when he was a missionary in Cambodia, I went to him. I, they said, Pastor, can you pray for this missionary and his wife? I went to them. I said, you know what? You're not going to be a missionary anymore. You're going to be a developer and you're going to make a lot of money. <gasps> and today they are a successful developer building all kinds of wonderful cluster bungalows for people. And they, they decided that they're going to try to help the church and build it. They, they, by the way, that couple, they really built another new life in, in Phnom Penh. We have another new life, there are two. Another one, is they paid half a million to build everything for free. This guy I prophesied on to become a developer has built this place, the other church, so Pierce Church, for free, literally. Imagine that. Seven years ago, he's just a missionary. And that word came and changed his life, and God blessed him, and he blessed the church today. Amen? Amen. Come on! <laughs> These are real stories. It's not make-believe. You can go there and see, and they can, they can meet these people. Come with me to Cambodia. I tell you, everything declares by the Lord, God, God will do it. God will do it. God is a God of miracles. He's our champion. What about your life? So today, I want to set your life right. I want to shift the way you think. I want to shift the way you live. I want to take what you have and say, God, if you can do that for a country so poor, the people so poor, and today, they've been given by you, Lord, in such a great way. God, you are the same God that I serve. You see? But I can tell you about the Cambodians. 
my brothers and sisters, they really are on fire for God. I, I knew them when they were single. Now that they're even married, they're still serving God. Now they've got kids who are toddlers. They're still serving God. Now that I'm back, their kids are now teenagers. They're still serving God on fire. There is no season. It is serving God all the way. How do you think they get that way, that size? The experience, stay experience, it still work. They don't retire. They refire. Amen? So it is so important. It's so, so important for us to know how and what we're doing, the priorities of life. And they, there are people who are simple, but they're not stupid. There are people who are hardworking. They love the Lord. They work hard for the Lord. And so it is, it is, it is time that we understand what God is doing in the midst of the churches today. Amen? So God doesn't want a mega church or a mini church. That's not God's plan for any church. You don't care what the people out there write and determine and try to be smart. I tell you, if you're a mega church, you can be a prideful church. We're the best. You can be a mini church. You can also be a prideful church. We're small, but we've got high quality. That's both is wrong. Both is sinful. Both is really out of insecurity. Amen? We want to build what? We want to build a model church. We want to build a model church. That's what God says. That's why I told Cambodia. And they say, amen. They believe that. That's always been my call to them. You build a model church. A model after Jesus. Loving Jesus, loving people. When you love Jesus and you love God and you love people the way God loves them, you will automatically become humble. You don't have to try to be humble. If you truly love, you will be humble. You know why? Because when you truly love, you have to say sorry. When you truly love, you have to apologize even though you're right because of the sake of relationships. If you truly know how to love, you will sacrifice. If you truly love, you will serve. If you truly love, you will stay no matter what. If you truly love, you're committed. That's what love shows. And that's why... God blesses those who love. Genuinely love, not by lip service. Not say one thing, but actually their mind, they, they only want to say the right thing, but in their heart it's not right. But when the church starts to know how to love each other and love God and, and really care for one another, and that humility will be natural. Love, out of love will come humility. I don't think you, you realize it, right? Out of love comes humility. Humility is not something you try and create because when you try to create humility, it's called false humility. You didn't do it out of love. You do it because you want to act a certain behavior. But when you truly love, Christ was so humble, he washed the feet. Like what Matthew spoke about in Impact last, uh, last, yesterday. When you love, you will, you will overlook offenses. When you love, you will know that God is still there no matter what. When you love, you will have faith. Because faith is knowing, is, what is faith? Faith is knowing, knowing what God can do. And when you have faith, you have hope. What is hope? Hope is knowing who God is to you. It's different. It's not the same. If you know what God can do, because you know He can do miracles, your faith arises. And then when you're challenged, and the faith has not arrived yet, and the answer has not come yet, you ride on hope until it comes to pass. Because the thing that carries you to your faith and believing is the journey of hope. Because when it has not been answered yet, you need hope. And how do you have hope? Hope is knowing who you are to God and who God is. And when you know the identity of who you are and who God is, you know that even though you have not had the answer, you will stay faithful. You will stay committed. You will stay with God. And even though things are not going your way, it's going for other people's way, but not your way, you wait. Because those who wait upon the Lord, He will renew their strength. They will mount up as wings of eagles. They will walk and not faint. And so when God answers, when God builds this church, when God builds what we're doing, we have to understand and believe this, is that God will answer us with three types of miracles. 
When God answers us with three types of miracles, we have to understand that that's a result of who we are to God. God will give us three types of miracles in our life. The first one is salvation. So God will give us salvation because through our prayer of faith, number one, we will receive salvation in life. That is the first gift that God gives to us. That God is someone that will save if we call upon Him. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says that, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourself. It is a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. And so when God saves and God increases, that's where because we have watered and we have planted like Apollos and Paul in the Bible, but God caused it to grow. And healthy things grow, what Edwin said yesterday. And when they grow, it's because God has deemed it to grow because it's a place that's conducive to growth. And so when we live a life where we have committed to God, our salvation is a free gift of God. He gives to us freely. We don't have to do anything. Just believe, receive salvation. Today, maybe, this is your opportunity, opportunity to come back to God, for you to be saved. And today, you have to make that gift. Today, you can have that gift. Today, you can make it happen when you give your life to Jesus. And the second great miracle that God will do, the first one is salvation. The second great miracle God will do in your life is to bless you. Now, the blessing is different. Now, blessing is, salvation is given for those that believe in Christ. Blessing is given to both Christians and those not in Christ as well. The Bible tells us that the rain and the sunshine will benefit those who are even Christians and non-Christians. Matthew 5.45. And that tells us that God is no respecter of men. When you have fulfilled the principle of God, you'll be blessed. For example, if you honor your father and mother, all will go well with you and you have long life. This is a verse here, not for Christians, for everybody. If you're non-Christian, you honor your father and mother, all will go well with you and you have long life. If you are a Christian, you don't honor your parents, or things will not go well with you, but then you watch the other non-Christians, they are, and you're wondering why. It's because of this little area called honoring parents. When you honor your parents, all will go well with you. And so when you do that, you, you know that. And so it, it, it extends to spiritual parents. It extends to then honoring the people that are in leadership as well. Honor one another as well. When you have a house full of honoring people, speaking good, saying good, and not gossiping, and not slandering, and not killing each other, and snapping on each other, and backbiting each other, what happens to that place? It changes. Blessing comes. Amen? Amen? Our house divided cannot stand. That's logical. No one even have to teach you that. But a heart united, the house will stand. Because God says, Jesus says, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Amen? Because I will build my church, God says. But He cannot build what you're not united in. But when you're united, He will build it. Because what's the point of going somewhere where everyone's fighting and they are not able to agree? How, what can I build? You know, it doesn't make sense. But when you say, when pastor says, let's, Start a new life that you say, choose me to be your life that leader. When pastor says, you know, when we say, okay, let's stop bring souls on Resurrection Sunday. Let's really pray and fast and bring souls and see them get saved. When we want to have soul out camp, let's make sure that God, you know, you move in there and we see souls won. So winning is the heart, the heart of God. And so what God wants us to know is that the way we receive blessing is because we have fulfilled the principles of God. We have lived the way God us, wants us to live, and it will just flow. And now and then, the third thing that God wants to pour to us, first is salvation is free. That's the first miracle. Second miracle is blessings of the Lord. He gives to those who are saved and not saved, and He blesses who He wants to because that's His grace. The third miracle, the third miracle that God will give to you in your life is called rewards. Now, rewards is very different. Rewards are not given to you if you're not a Christian. Number one, rewards are not given to you on earth. Rewards are given to you in heaven. Rewards are very different. That's something that most Christians don't understand. They understand about blessing. Bless me, pastor. I want the blessing of God. Bless you, sister. God bless you. Yeah, blessing is on earth. Rewards is what you get in heaven. That's where we miss out. We think they're the same. They're not the same. 
in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said, you know, told a story. And I'm going to talk about the story some other time in the parables that we're leading. We're looking at parables today. But, but, but he says the rewards that you have in that story of the talent of the one and the two and the five, the end is when, what, when you will get it when you meet your father. And rewards is different in two ways. One, reward you get it in heaven, not on earth. Reward is given to you when you obey the Lord and fulfill the responsibility that God has chosen you to partake of. When you say, God, you've called me to go to Bible school, I'm going to obey and I'm going to go. And then when I go to Bible school, I'm going to come out to be more like Jesus. And I'm going to love more like Jesus. And, 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 and that's what God wants. And, and then when you come and you start serving, since I go to Bible school, I come out of Bible school, I'm going to start serving. I'm going to be like Jesus, a servant. Then it shows that what I've studied is coming to pass in my heart. Then I, I, I act like a, a servant, I serve like a servant, and I love like a servant. Because I want to be like Jesus, who says the greatest of all is those that serve others. And so I want to be great in his eyes, not in men's eyes. And so reward is to, totally different. It's when you obey and you fulfill the call of God in your life. So I don't want to see you miss out on your rewards in heaven. You can be blessed on earth and we'll say kudos to you. But I, I as your pastor, I, I want the last one to happen. Salvation, done already. Okay, tick off the box. I've got you there. I've set you out of hell into heaven. Great. Number two, tick you on the box right now. You're blessed. Okay, and so we're preaching. We're anointed and we're teaching and you're forming yourself and God is blessing your life and everything that you're doing. And, and that's great in many, many ways. You know, spiritually, mentally, physically, materially. Yeah, great. That's, that's the grace of God in your life. And then lastly, reward. That one want to help you. Get going on your reward. Get your reward up there, filled by what you're doing on earth. On, on, on top, when you get there, you collect your reward. Down here, you start living your life, fulfilling the call of God in your life. Then you will get your reward. And so, it's very important to understand that. And so then... Then it comes that then we know that salvation, blessing, and reward are three parts of a Christian life, are the miracles that God does in our life. Then what about prayer? If I've got blessing from God that's good by grace and by salvation, I'm given as a free gift of God, and reward is what I do for the Lord as I serve Him, and I'll get it in heaven when I die, when I see Him, then that's great. Then what about my prayer life? Of course your prayer life is important. And, and to a Christian, the prayer life is everything because Christians have got needs. And, and part and parcel of your journey is God answering your prayers because you've got needs in your life. And how does that work? So Jesus understand. Jesus understand that prayer is important and there are many kinds of prayer. So he teaches the disciples here in Luke 11, quickly now we're going to learn, in Luke 11 about the simplicity of our heart, of our prayers being effective is that it is not how you pray, it is not the form you pray, is, but it's who you believe God is to you. It's who you believe God is to you. Is that the one you're praying to, the one you're asking, who is that person to you in your life? So yeah, he teaches them, pray this way, Father, hallowed your name, your kingdom come, Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. It's a very simple prayer, but it was complex to the people. Why do I say it was complex to Israel? Because when they said, Hello be to you, my Father. God, my Father. When he mentioned the word Father, they have no idea, most of them, who he's talking about. Because to them at the time, God was a judge. You have to have a Pharisee life, a Sadducee life, a priestly life. You've got all these hundreds of laws you have to fulfill in order to get accepted by God. So God was basically someone who is my examiner, taking away whether I pass or I don't pass. Then my life should have been based on that. So to them, God was someone who was a... Who was a, uh, was a Someone you don't play around with. And they know the story of what God did with Israel in the, in the wilderness. 
So when he said father, it was like, father? What is this father God thing? So he teaches them for the, to reveal that God is someone that you can call Abba Father. And then he knew he didn't understand. So right after that, after telling them, this is how I should pray, pray to God because you know who God is and who you are to God. And then he looked at them, they kind of like give him this eye where they don't really understand. They said, okay, I'm going to give you a more practical story. Then he goes to a practical story to explain the, the Lord's Prayer. Then this is just right after that. Right after that, he says, I tell you this. So these are, so the story I'm going to read now, the parable is connected to the Lord's Prayer to help them to understand what the Lord's Prayer means. So if you want to understand the Lord's Prayer and to find the effectiveness in it, you have to understand this story. When you understand this parable story, you understand how to pray. You understand that when you pray, you get answered. And when you pray, you will see God move in a way that you never thought was possible. Amen? Okay? And so he said this story to them. And then after this story, they got it. They said, aha, uh-huh, we understand now how to pray now as you're teaching us, oh rabbi. Okay? And so he says then to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him in the midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on the journey will come and I will have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of the friendship, yet, because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. This whole story here explains the Lord's uh, Supper. I'm sorry, the Lord's Prayer. What he's saying is this. When he tells a story, they get it completely because it was their culture that this story is not going to happen at all. So they know it's a ridiculous story, but it helps them to understand who God is and how they should approach God. So he says this to them. He says, at midnight, this guy goes and, I need food. Give me three bread because my friend is in journey in here and got nothing at home. Can you please give me some food for my friend at midnight? Now, in the first place in Israel, you don't go knocking at people's door at midnight. They will kill you. You will break the friendship straight away. I know midnight is where you just got awake, okay? Or, or, or you're working for maybe Gen Z's, all right? But, but let me say this to you, okay? At midnight, these guys are already deep in their, in their pattern of sleep. You know, if sleep has a pattern, you'll be in the deepest part of their sleep already. You have gotten them in a place where their collagen is working. Their beauty sleep is in place. And you're waking them up and the wrinkles are starting to act already. This is an audacity to the Lord. This is what's happening. At 12, people are starting to sleep because in Israel, they sleep around 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Even today, my friend sleeps at 9 o'clock. Okay? I don't know how they do that, but they, they do. Okay? It's a, it's a miracle of God. But... So they sleep at 9, and they're in the deep of their sleep, and you call them at midnight, knocking on the door. You're waiting to get a fight with them. And the other thing is this, is that, so he says, this guy who's knocking is not a friend. This guy who's knocking has no consideration for his friend who's in the house. This guy who's knocking is just shameless and rude. That's why he says shameless audacity, because nobody actually would do that. But the guy who, if there's really a guy who did that, that shameless guy, okay? He, he's going to have, after that, there's no more friendship with that guy. So he's talking about that person. Then the person inside, his attitude also was pretty bad, okay? So the father is said, oh, what? Go away, no food, no, all oh, steam. My kids are all over the place on my body. Why are the kids all over his body? Because in Israel, when they, when they live, they live in a house that's usually about 1,000 square feet maximum. I know that sounds kind of big in Singapore, okay? All right, but it's kind of small there. Why? Because there's four generations living in that house. Don't forget, they get married at 15, 16 years old. By the time they are already 30, their grandmother. All right, and so there. So when you're in Israel, you basically have four generations minimum staying. Great grand is already alive still. And they're all staying in the same house because they are very family centric. So in the middle of the night when he's sleeping, he's got Kong Kong Mama both sides. He's got Auntie Uncle maybe 
okay, and he's got cousins sleeping over, and then he's got his own kids. And then another thing about Israel at that time, they have a lot of children. Okay, my mom came home a line, or maybe, you know, my dad and mom combined was more than 20 uncles and aunties, okay? And so I cannot remember names, okay, because there's too many during Chinese New Year. Okay, so you know those generations in Singapore, you know, the great grandmother generations, 10, 12 kids, they're pregnant the whole time. You see them the first day to the, the time they go to the funeral, you know, they're pregnant every year, that kind of thing. Okay, so that's what it was. That's what Israel was. Okay, so they were, they were kids galore, family galore, tiny place. So they're sleeping all over him and they're all over the floor and you have to get out and bring baby boy out, bring baby girl out of the leg, yeah, and then move and then crawl over, uncle, auntie, uncle, uncle, all that, get you three bread and pass to you. That is impossible. Okay, that is not possible. So he's explaining they're all laughing. Okay, hopefully you're laughing as well, okay. All right, try to be like Jesus. So what he was saying is this, is that the person who's knocking is not you. And the person inside who's reluctant to give is not God. He's saying, if that person who's so shameless and rude can get what he wants, what more you, a child of God? And if that man could no matter how bad it was, still could get up and go over all the obstacles to give bread, how much more your God will give to you. And that's what it's about. So then then they understand, our Father who are in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. As we forgive our sins, as you forgive your sins, we forgive the sin against us and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so that Lord's prayer then becomes reality to them. They understand when I now pray, I know who I am. And when I pray to God, I know who He is. And then when I pray, something happens. So that's my story today. That's what I want to get you to do today. Because 2024, the first quarter has just gone by. Now it's April already. We want to get your life where when you pray and when you seek the Lord, you know, God, I'm saved. You know, I know, God, I'm blessed. But God, I know as I serve you in the building the house of God, I'm going to be rewarded eventually. But God, as I do all these things, as I walk each day, I've got specific things. But God says, I know them better than you. I know you better than yourself. God, do I know my needs? Yeah, God says, I know your needs. I know you better than you. And God says, you can pray, but your prayer doesn't mean, doesn't mean anything unless you know why you're praying, what you're praying, and who you're praying to, and who you are to the person you're praying to. And when you know that, and when you know that, your prayers will shift. Things will shift in your life. And that's very important for you to understand as we march on. I believe this. I believe that I believe that God's going to do some stuff today that's really going to rock this place. I believe that some of you are going to shift the way you pray and as we go back into one more worship song that you're going to come and understand that God gives and God answers. And it will shift. It will shift things around. And it will either shift the situation, shift the timing of the answer, or shift you. Something will shift today. But whether it's the answer type or the timing or you yourself shift, it's all going to be good anyway. And when that happens, things are going to, things are going to be great in your life. I believe that with all my heart. So, so, I, so when you pray and when you want God to answer something, first learn to hear God and start speaking words of life, declaring it as God speaks. That's the way you pray. See, Jesus doesn't want you to pray like this man Knocking on the time, bugging, until you answer. Oh God, please, please ask, please give to me. Every day, ask the same thing, ask the same thing, ask the same thing. Ask, 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 ask. Pray five times a day, pray ten times a day. You think God answered? God doesn't answer that way. He's not saying that. It's not about your persistent harassing of Him that will get it answered. He was, He will send His angels and stop, give you a harassment notice. All right, you got a, got a court order from the, from the judge up there. Okay, stop harassing me with your, uh, your question, your badgering, okay? I will answer, God says. You just ask and believe. I will answer, 
Okay? And that's what he wants you to do. Oh, and we run story. Can we the team up here? Thank you so much. So, so this week, so, so last week I was, I was there. So I was, I was in Cambodia, right? So was I in Cambodia last week? I was, right? Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I was there. And then, so this is a country where nobody has an English name. Okay? Uh, nobody has an English name. I've been there 30 years, and I cannot remember all their names at all. I know all your faces, but I cannot remember. It's just very complicated. So, so, so it's my fault, okay? I've got this weakness of mem- remembering names. So all the names in Cambodia are like uh, Samnang, Pisit, Sorong, da 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 you know, and so, you know, uh, Seha. So all Kham- Khmer names, Khmer names, okay, every one of them. So I'm going to God, I'm, I'm about to preach. So God, calls, God gives, gives me a name. I said, man, I'm here for the anniversary. I'm speaking, and oh, you gotta, this has got to happen. I said, God, you said, I'm going to call out this name, and I'm not going to give you a Kamai name. Okay, I know a lot of Kamai names. I can just shoot them out. They will probably hit one somebody. Is that me going to America, call out Peter or John? I'll probably get somebody, okay? I said, God, God says, I want to give you an English name in a Kamai country. Holy cow. I said, oh, sorry. You know? So I said, oh my goodness, you know, how is this going to work? And then he gives me some more a name called, this a girl's name called Maria. Maria. There's no party, I guarantee you, with the thousands called Maria at all, okay? All right? And so I get up there and I preach and then I didn't want to say that word. I didn't want to, I don't want, I didn't want to say it. I just want to preach, okay? Because I got a very good message. But God said, say that name, say it. And then I stop, okay? Say is that Maria here? No, Maria. Silence. Thousand silence. They must say, what, 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 what is the word Maria? Is it, you know, it's like maybe he's scolding us. I don't know. So, you know, I said, is that Maria here? No, no, Maria. And then he's Cambodian. No, Maria. So I, I stopped and I stopped, okay? And then the, and, and, and then the, the, then the Lord said, um, um, just wait. So I went there and then I, had, I went to, I was going to ask the Brazilians, you know, they have six Brazilians. Uh, is any of your daughters Maria? I mean, it sounds South American name, you know. Uh, but, but, God says, no, don't ask them. So I didn't ask them. Okay. <laughs> that, that is true, true story. <laughs> then, then, then the pastor comes after I finish. Pastor, pastor comes and he comes and he draws me here and he says, uh, Pastor, Pastor, I want, you to, I want you to meet this baby. His name is, the baby's name is Maria. The parents' names are K- K- Kamai. Then, then I, then baby, only one. Then I got, I got, I got her. And then we went to the room. And then I said, so this is interesting. So the word wasn't for the baby. The word was for the mother. So I turned to her. I said, you know, God told me. He said, bring Maria here. But God wants to speak to you, mother. And I gave her that word. Wow, she bawled her eyes out. She knelt on the floor. She was crying. And Jesus was setting her free. And God was healing her. She was, she was going through so much as a mother. She was going through depression, postnatal blues, and different things she was going through. And it was just a very difficult position. And God just came and helped her. And, and you know, and, and the pastors were there. They listened to it. So it's all public news. But it was glory to God. Amen. So God, so God answers. Amen. God answers. God answers. God answers. God answers. So I want you to come up. I want you to pray. I want you to seek God. I want you to declare things in your life today. Uh, I got one more story I want to talk about. One more miracle story. You know, God's doing miracles every, every week, you know. And I think you've got to understand that God is God of miracles. He doesn't sit still. We're not into religion. We're not, we're not having church here. We're, we're doing life with God. Amen. That you're just here to listen to God. We're doing life with God. So this week, as I came back, so Monday I came back, Tuesday morning my wife said, can you pray for Pastor Stefano from Sarang, a pastor there from Sarang. He says, he's, his wife just texted me and he's got, he's got dengue and his blood payload is very low and they don't know how long he's going to be in the hospital. So you could be there for days or weeks, you know, when you've got this low blood payload and you cannot recover. And I said, okay, I'll pray for him. So before I pray for him, I, you know, usually pray, oh, I pray for you right now, blah, 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 God bless you, you know. But God says, I told God, God, you tell me what's going to happen. I said, God, you tell me what's going to happen. And God says, you tell him this. So I sent him a text and a voicemail. I said, God, this is what God says to you. Your blood platelet now, I declare, will increase. And by Friday, you will leave the hospital. 
the end. Okay, that's all I said. Okay, and then send it to him. Okay, then on Friday, Friday, I get a text from him. Okay, and the text says this. Okay, Pastor, today is Friday. I'm leaving the hospital. The words of the prophet has come to pass. God bless you. Amen. This is the God we serve. This is the God that can do miracles. The songs we sung, those five songs, one set that we sung, defines who you are, defines who God is to you. Can we stand right now? So what's the action plan today? You come to church every week must have an action plan. Don't just listen to something and do know nothing about it. But when you do something about it, your life changes straight away. It improves, it grows. There's shift, there's a shift, there's a shift, there's a shift. So I want to shift every day. You keep shifting every week, you're going to be so different in a year from now. Your life is going to be so blessed. So I want you to think right now. What are your greatest needs, your greatest cares, your greatest fears, your greatest concerns, your greatest desires, whatever they are, they are from God. God knows. And they are used to honour the Lord, they are from God. And God knows. And so, I'd like you to do this, to come up here to the altar and tell the Lord, Lord, I'm stepping out here to show you, God, that I... Not because I want prayers answered, but God, I know who I am. I know my position, my identity. I know who you are, your nature, your identity. And Lord, I'm going to come up here and I'm going to declare. I'm going to speak life. I'm going to speak truth. I'm going to say to my situation. I'm going to say to my career. I'm going to say to my marriage. I'm going to say to my children. I'm going to say to my mind. I'm going to say to my depression. I'm going to say to my fears. I'm going to say to everything. I want to see a change. And I'm going to declare it. And it's going to shift, Lord, in my life. Whatever it may be that is important to you, whatever you need, whatever you desire, whatever you dream, whatever it is, say and dare to ask from the Lord. Dare to ask from the Lord. And the Lord will give exceedingly abundantly more than you can ever ask or imagine whatever you ask today whatever you imagine today he's gonna go even further whatever you desire he says more than you can imagine so whatever you imagine he's gonna top that even that's the God you serve that's the God you serve that's the God of your life and so as you come out you're trying to tell God God doing something in my life Try so hard to see it. Took me so long to believe it. That you choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never end. You give what we don't deserve. It. You take. to glory cause you are my champion a giant's for when you sit and are defeated in every battle you've won I am who you say I am you crown me with confidence I am seen Try so hard to see it. It took me so.
given his whole life what has nothing to prove to you anymore how much he loves you you don't have to question God anymore 
about whether you're loved by God or not, or whether He cares for you or not, or whether He's meeting your needs or not. He knows and He is God and He loves you. He's laid down, He's given His whole life for you. If you are the only person that existed in the world, He would have still come down for you. Because that's how precious you are. That's who you are, how much He loves you. Don't ever question again whether He loves you or not. Don't ever question whether He's close to you or not. He didn't leave you, you left Him. If you're going to leave, it's not because He left you, because you left Him. He will never leave you or forsake you. The question is not Him, the question is you. Will you leave and forsake Him? Would you doubt and sink? Or would you believe and rise? It all depends on today. But you make the decision to be standing here in the front or in the back, in the back or in the front, left or the right, you make a decision today. You say, God, no longer will I question you or who you are to me. I will walk faithfully with you. Yeah, sure, you will make mistakes. You might fall and fail. But you know what? You will get up and say, you know, I'm going to go again. You will always get up because a righteous man Fall seven and he will come out, meaning that whatever happens, you will always get up and still follow God. And when you do that, he will be there for you. He's there and he will always be there. No matter where you are in life, he's there. You're in your sin, he's still there. You're in your best place with God, he's still there. That's how great that love is not conditioned on you it's a condition of who He is to you it's not dependent on your nature but God's nature and that's why we look to God always for who He is to us and we stand by that nature and say we can and we will overcome thank you Lord for the power I believe I'm, I'm listening that's why I pause I believe that some of you will see some great answers this year. Yeah, some of you have gotten some bad news, rough news, not good news. But that doesn't mean you will not have any great news. And I believe even when you go through the difficulties of this year, you are going to receive great news this year. Great news is coming. Good news is coming. New things are happening. New beginnings, new relationships are growing. Changes are coming, says the Lord God Almighty. Watch me do it. A lot of times it will be God that will do it. You don't have to do anything. Sounds so simple? Yeah, it is. If it was any harder, the cost is not needed at all. Yes, God says, I will do it for you. Just trust me. You need to live this year trusting God. Not just praying to God, but trusting God after you pray. You hear that? You hear that? You hear that? That's what God's saying. Trust me. Trust me. Just trust me, God says. Just trust me. I'm going to do it for you. Ooh, and it happens. Your faith is at a different level. Well, the peace comes. The peace comes, strength comes. When you, when you hear God says, trust me, and you say, yes, God, I trust you. Ooh, something shifts. The peace, the hope, the strength, the joy starts to come. Because when we trust, these things come in.